Hello and welcome to Comic-Con After Hours, uh, produced, presented by Heavy Metal, which is fantastic. I am the Kurt Bros of NerdBot, and with me today are some great guests. Let's start with, uh, I guess Ben's over to my left. Let's start with Ben Dicko. I am Ben Dicko. I lead a space museum up in LA. And then going straight below me on my screen, Matthew Mendy, if you want to introduce yourself. What's up, guys? I'm Matt. Uh, I am the CEO of Heavy Metal and the uh, author of Beyond Kuiper with uh, my friend over there, John Connolly. Well, then that leads right into John Connolly. Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm John. Um, I am also a co-author of Beyond Kuiper with my friend, Matt Mendy, who's, I'm not sure he's below me on my screen, but he might be somewhere else anyways. <laughs> it's Tetris. Uh, <laughs> and my daytime job is I am an aerospace engineer for Lockheed Martin Space. Great. So we have two scientists and a CEO slash writer, and that's because we're talking about putting science in science fiction. Uh, so let's just start right off. We'll, we'll dive right into Beyond Kuiper, which is a project coming up produced by uh, Heavy Metal. And uh, I don't know who wants to talk. Well, actually, well, let's go. Let's go to John first and let's talk about you're the science guy. What is Beyond Kuiper? And, and kind of give me the, the 10 cent overview to get somebody interested. Beyond Kuiper is near is near future technology um i really want to explore that we've gotten over our kind of current hurdle and we're, we've taken our first steps out into interplanetary travel um but also look at you know has technology over the next 70 plus years you know in overall helped us or has it hurt us and you know there are fantastic things that people do but has it improved the overall human condition and so we get to explore uh, you know, space propulsion, uh, advances in nanotechnology, digital technology, uh, power sources. You know, some of these are, I was gonna say, none of them are fantastical from our Earth perspective. All of them are grounded. You can tie them back into something that is, you know, peer reviewed papers that have been released. Uh, so, so it's a lot of just kind of a one step of beyond what we have right now kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, I, I, to, to jump in right there, I, I would say that. You know, John, John, John needs to get a lot of credit on this stuff because, like, I'll come up with something, you know, batshit crazy. And instead of John just trying to, like, uh, you know, say absolutely not, he'll, like, spend all night looking for papers that can semi-justify the idea. And, like, he'll call me the next morning and be like, I found this peer review paper from 2014 that, in theory – if this evolved and iterated five times over the next five decades, what you said might be possible if we change these two things and let's do it that way. So, I mean, the, the ability for John to take what in my head was totally fantastical and not really rooted in anything real and turn that into like a propulsion drive that, you know, could reach the Kuiper belt in two and a half years, plausibly, and built over the next 70 years, it, it, it was, it's just incredible the uh, amount of actual science that he's been able to weave into this fantastical world. I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> hey, that's why we're all here, right? It's, it's three, including myself, scientists, and then another nerd who's into sci-fi. So this and, is and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've watched every How the Universe Works through the wormhole, so I'm like a quasi-scientist myself. <laughs> Great. Well, you know what? I want to bring Ben in this too. So, Ben, you're you're not involved with this project, but you do a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, educational outreach for mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from from your perspective, is is this the kind of thing we need more of? These kind of grounded science fiction stories. Absolutely, hard science science fiction is an entry drug, I think, for kids to get into science and to kind of pursue aerospace engineering or anything like that. Um, I mean, I was inspired by Star Wars, you know, a long time ago to want to be an astronaut and, you know, study physics and all that kind of stuff. It's, it is absolutely the way that a lot of kids get into this stuff. Um, and you see it, like, you talk to scientists every day and they're always like, oh, yeah, I saw this when I was a kid, you know, Star Trek or whatever. And, uh, and that led me down this path of maybe into biology or something completely different, not space related, but it's absolutely fires up a love for science. So we need no, more that, of it. That's a fantastic point. You know, I, I'm a wildlife biologist, um, actually professional wildlife biologist, still doing it. And oh, um, what, what, what got me into it was I grew up reading Fantastic Four and Spider-Man comics and they were scientists. So Read that's actually, records all day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have a little less hair, but probably a little more gray if I, if I let it grow in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was... Actually, 
that was the fantastic thing too. Sorry to use the word fantastic a million times, but like all the most of the heroes, especially in Marvel, they were all scientists. Even Peter Parker was a teenage science genius. You know, it's like they all same thing with Iron Man. Exactly, teenage yeah, teen, genius. Mm-hmm. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. Now, I guess you know I should I should backtrack just a little bit because I'm I'm geeking out. I'm a science guy. Um, so the, the title Beyond Kuiper deals with the Kuiper Belt. So who wants to, John, you want to bring up what is the Kuiper Belt? I guess we, should, <laughs> we, should start, we should start slow and then let people into it. It's a good okay. idea. So <laughs> most people are familiar with the asteroid belt that lies between Mars and Jupiter. The Kuiper Belt is about 20 times larger, and it extends from just inside the orbit of Neptune out for many astronomical units to the um, and it literally rings the edge of the solar system. And scientists believe that it contains most of the remnants of when the solar system formed. So very old comet pieces and asteroids and pieces of that now and again are the ones that eventually end up dropping into the solar system and occasionally causing a mass extinction. Well, mass extinctions are probably generally bad, but- Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, and, and, um, and then you know, our tale, that's not, we have our own yeah. human generated mass extinction. Right yes. now, we don't need an asteroid to help us. <laughs> and, and just to just to piggyback on that, the way uh, the way that we kind of looked at it was the um, the Kuiper Belt almost acts as like a, a, a quasi first level of defense for Earth in a sense. Mm-hmm. And we had the simple idea of what if the Kuiper Belt wasn't a, a means of defense for Earth but a means of defense for the galactic society. And it was to quarantine any civilization that was too hostile to interact with the rest of the galaxy. And the (laughs) Galactic Star Alliance, the GSA, that is the governing body inside the BKU, um, puts these things called... um, Sea of Rocks. uh, Sea of Rocks, which what we call the... Kuiper Belt, and they yes. put seas of rocks uh, around any solar system that they classify as a Class T planet, a terraform hungry planet that is too hostile to coexist with the 600,000 sentient worlds throughout the GSA. And that, that's kind of where we start. Well, that's actually a great jumping off point because I, I put down some of the kind of bullet points I saw when I was reading through the description, which is on heavy metal. Um, And, you know, it mentions like Drake equation, Fermi paradox, and kind of this idea, um, you guys can go more into it, but the idea that the universe either is or is not full of life. There's a chance that it's full of life, but why haven't we seen aliens? You know, there are people that say we have, but we have not physically (laughs) seen an alien on the White House lawn or in my backyard, just saying hi, stopping by. So, Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, to speak to that, I mean, the function of the Kuiper Belt and, or the Sea of Rocks in this story is to act as a effectively a two-way jamming field, blocking signals from Earth leaving and also blocking any signals coming from aliens entering our solar system, which would leave us blind up until we had technology capable of leaving, such as the Voyager probes. Um, but to that point, yes, given the enormity of space and the length of time of civilizations, the chances of us running into another one are very low. However, we reasoned if civilizations were capable, if one did eventually reach another, they had to exist for orders of magnitude longer than Earth civilization has, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years consecutively. So if you can reason that, then you can say, all right, maybe there are a bunch of civilizations that overlap. If their technology is so great that they spread so far, even if there were cataclysmic things that took out entire planets or civilizations as a whole, there's enough technology that keeps the whole thing moving forward. And so you know, Earth is unaware of a hundred million year long group of civilizations that have existed in our galaxy. And that, so that's, that's the take that we have. So in, in some ways, bring this back to kind of science and science fiction. Um, it's sort of like a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy universe in a sense where Maybe there's aliens doing things out there, but they just don't involve us because we're kind of beneath them in the sense that we're too aggressive or, or maybe well, a danger. Yeah, it's not um, developed enough. Yeah. Yes. As well as the Sea of Rocks does act, act to protect planets such as ours because otherwise... There are terrorist organizations out there that want to eradicate terraform-hungry planets. Oh, well, I was going to say, or just want to use us to play God. 
Yes. Which you could also reason could have happened multiple times over human history. Could be aliens randomly meddling and then maybe other aliens telling them to stop. So, you know, we wanted to be able to also weave within Earth history and how far we could stretch it. And that goes forwards and backwards as well, because uh, there's a lot of emerging proof in archaeology that Earth civilization might have extended a lot further back than what we could. That's actually, um, yeah, that's a great point. And bringing in real science, I just saw um, an article today about, uh, what was it? Uh, they potentially moved the age of people in the Americas back a little bit because mm-hmm. there's artifacts that might be another five, 10,000 years old in Mexico, I think it was today. So, you know, that's great. You know, the, the whole idea of, of, you know, back and forward in time. There's, and, and we're learning every day you know, about more, yeah. uh, you know, humanoid species. Right. I think uh, for a long time we thought there was two or three, and now I believe it's up to five or six potentially that cohabitat uh, coexisted during the same eras before the the uh, Homo sapien uh, kind of won out. So I think we're learning a lot about human history on this planet every every year, and, and it's evolving and changing because um, we don't know that full story quite yet. Exactly. Great. And then um, another another idea I, I think I saw in there from the book is uh, CERN. Correctly, you, you yes uh, yes. So how does how does CERN? Well, I guess if you want to give a two second overview of what CERN is for people, why, why doesn't why doesn't Ben give that? So uh, oh sure, give, of give course. <laughs> no, this is great. I'm learning a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember what CERN stands for, but it's this huge microscope, basically out in uh, in Geneva or nearby Geneva in Europe that is a particle accelerator. And it just takes subatomic particles and smushes them together. It takes miles going around a ring of several miles, I think. And, uh, and that's how they're able to break apart atoms and subatomic particles and find out what is actually at the very base of, of matter in the universe. Now, uh, go on with that, I guess. Oh, no, no. What were you going to oh, say, Kurt? I, yeah, I was just going to go off that with Ben. So um, you do a lot of the educational outreach. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're with a museum if you want to still, mm-hmm. correct? If you want oh, yeah. to, yeah. Which museum is it? The Columbia Memorial Space Center. We're in uh, just a little bit south of downtown LA. Perfect. Now, I know something like CERN, there's a lot of conspiracies and things around it. So if somebody comes, comes to you and says, hey, CERN, or, you know, these various uh, science things that people just kind of don't understand what's going on, um, you know, is CERN going to kill us all with a black hole? Are they trying to open the gate to hell? You know, what, what kind of outreach would you do to to say, hey, this is the actual science happening. <laughs> I would say there's nothing to worry about. Um, you know, this is, it's funny because we just got done with this discussion about like sort of pushing back the dates of, of human history and stuff like that. It's, it's this, it's the nature of science, right? We, scientists are skeptical and we're constantly learning and curious about new things and adding new knowledge to our knowledge base all the time. That is great and it's the power of science. It's what's got us to where we are. At the same time though, it opens up these, um, I don't know, wormholes of doubt in some people's minds because they're like, wow, if you're changing the story all the time, then how can I believe anything that you're saying is true? And then, yeah, maybe there are, who's to say that there weren't a bunch of alien species on earth beforehand and all that kind of stuff. Or CERN's gonna create a black hole and suck us all into it or anything. That is a constant thing. And it seems like every year we're getting more and more of that, even from kids asking questions about that. Um, you know, the best thing that we can do is to, to provide a experiential sort of uh, lesson around science so that people can experience this stuff for themselves and discover it on, for themselves. Um, not to get too much on a soapbox, but science to me in a lot of us in the education field is it's a, it's a verb, not a noun. So science is a way of discovering things about the universe through a a method or a thought process, however you want to describe it. So if you give people chances to practice that, which everybody has the capability of, they're going to come around to this fact of like, oh, wait, I have to weigh evidence and actually, you know, do some research and figure the stuff out before you kind of go off on all these conspiracy theories and things like that. So it's a tough, it's a tough line though. And I, we're totally hearing it more and more every day. (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't agree agree more with that, Ben. The the uh, the scientific method, right? And the uh, and and you know, with things happening in today's current uh, pandemic, 
the information mm-hmm. is always evolving and learning. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that they were wrong. It just means that it's now more identifiable. Yeah. And, yeah, and, exactly. and that's, a, that's a really good, like, kind of microcosm to the larger science problem that being wrong isn't bad. It just right. means that you're closer to being right. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and uh, just to kind of bring that full circle, Kurt, what happens with CERN is, um, you know, in, in 2086, they're um, doing a lot of antimatter tests, um, maybe with too much, and a uh, terrorist organization in the GSA is trying to gather data about Earth's worthiness, and they have to, you know, activate a planetary failsafe to ensure that the alien terrorists don't make it to the planet. But unfortunately, you know, activating that p- failsafe while uh, actively um, uh, experimenting on antimatter doesn't bode well for CERN and mm-hmm. doesn't bode well for uh, the giant crater of a hole that is left there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not spoiling too much so that <coughs> happens in the first eight pages. But uh, yeah, we, we, we thought it was prudent to blow up CERN as a uh, <laughs> understanding of how our universe starts. You know, there's a personal connection to this, I have to say. Uh, I grew up outside of Chicago, which is where Fermilab is. And up until CERN, it was the most powerful particle accelerator on the planet. And it doesn't bother me that CERN gets blown up. And that Fermi gets, <laughs> is, I used to take physics classes there when I was a kid. And it, that's fine if that wins again. Amazing. You know, uh, just, just thinking about that, I guess something um, to bring up, too, is just this, the scale of CERN and Fermi and these particle accelerators. Well, how big are we talking? I mean, they're not obviously the size um, of the desk there. Is it, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, is it 27 miles or kilometers in diameter? Uh, it's in Europe, so it's probably kilometers, but kilometers. yes. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's huge. And I mean, F- Fermilab is, you know, it, it's also huge, but CERN is at least maybe, shoot, I want to say like 25% or 30% larger or something crazy like that. It's, it's I, know, I know it passes underneath borders in between yeah. federal countries. Yeah, exactly. Oh, CERN is large, and in the in Beyond Kuiper, there's a smoldering hole where there was a CERN. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, no, okay, no, it's not like all of the entire th- that would I don't I think we would have cracked the continent if there was a <laughs> hole that big. <laughs> okay, so maybe not a smoldering hole, but it's our complicating incident to bring us into the yes. Story. Yes, it is, it is a complicating incident that, like, you know, Kurt, to your point, I'd probably just put a hole in the continent, but John, John brought it back to, uh, to plausibility there. Yeah, the difference between a Transformers movie and a Star Trek episode. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. We, no, we, it we, can't we, be we, over 25 megatons. Like, we we always really like, uh, that. When, we, when, we, when we set out to write this book, and, and it, it's fortuitous that we're having this, uh, this meeting today, because this weekend we're putting our final touches on uh you know just grammar edits for the first book before it goes to print and uh, john was able to uncover a word document from 2016 that had like original notes on it which was like pretty cool to look back on and see and uh one of the notes on it was like science must pass the bill nye test you know like we really wanted to make sure that when when we set out from this we were like we want the science community to be like, you know, this is Star Trek. This isn't Star Wars. You know, this mm-hmm. is, this really has some some plausibility to it. And, and uh, you know, now four years later, and uh, the first book is getting, you know, ready to be in bookstores. Uh, we were able to, like, just plug in a little bit. We were able to partner with the number one audiobook publisher in science fiction, Podium Audio, who did The Martian, which is just an amazing audiobook. And they're publishing our... Beyond Kuiper audiobook and all the people that we've kind of been able to rally around to, to bring this to life is just, I feel, a, a testament to the ability for us to really stay true to that science core. Because because as you said, Ben, like I, even though I'm the odd man out here and not the, the scientist, science has always been, you know, a really important part of my life. And uh, be it, you know, watching, reading, learning through space centers and being different places, uh, that all derived from my love of Star Trek and how real that was. Yeah. And, um, and to me, it's really important that we wrote something that paid tribute to that sort of a childhood dream that I had. No, that, that's a great point. I have that as one of my talking points here. Is, it's kind of, um, you know, there's, there's what we always used to call hard science fiction. The science fiction that's more grounded in reality and there's stuff like the fantasy sci-fi like Star mm-hmm. Wars. Mm-hmm. 
Whereas hard sci-fi might be some of the older Star Trek. The newer Star Trek, maybe not as much, but, you know, <laughs> classic Star Trek. Well, I, well, what new Star Trek? Well, I don't even know it exists. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> but that is my point, you know, um, well, I guess we'll start with Ben and then we'll kind of go around. Um, what, are, what, are, what are a couple of great um, stories, pop culture things you, you've seen maybe in the past, you grew up on, that had some great science actually built into it rather than just kind of the fantasy elements? Well, I mean, uh, 2001 is the first movie that always comes to mind on this. And then, and then Star Trek, I would say. Um, I was all, a huge fan when I was a kid of A Wrinkle in Time and that whole series. Um, there's a absolute you know, hard science aspect to that, even though it is fantastical too. Um, yeah, so I'd say though, to personally, those are the the biggest ones for me. Um, and then yeah, I and then it's not science fiction, but I also was a big fan of the cosmos. So, okay. um, which I thought that you know, for as deadpan as Carl Sagan can be, um, he was combining pop culture and science. It was real pop, real culture, right? But um, really trying to put those two things together. So I just want to interject real quick. Yeah. Then we actually think. Carl Sagan oh, yeah. on the front oh, of the awesome. book. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> for for all of that. That is uh, you know, Pale Blue Dot and his whole like vision of society. It, it was the, you know, it was really the impetus for the story. I mean, not not to derail from the question, Kurt, too much, but we had the world built out for two years before we started writing it because we we didn't know how to write it. And we started talking to, you know, uh uh, associates and other writers that can maybe help us write it from a narrative standpoint. And then one day, John texted me, um, you know, consider again that dot, that's here, that's home. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I know how to write this book now. <laughs> and that was literally August 1st, 2017. I remember the text. He texted me and I was like, I know how this book starts. And that was the whole thing. And that, that's how the whole, uh, that's how we went from these, like, you know, we have like 500 pages of lore in a Google doc. Like, <laughs> like our lore has lore. Our main character, we know where his great grandfather went to college and what awards he got for the two books he wrote, Fantastical mm -hmm. Stardust. You know, the, the, these, the, uh, all of that was created, but we didn't know how to start it. And it was such a roadblock. And then, you know, Carl Sagan and just thinking about his perspective on science and fiction is what mm -hmm. kind of got us over that hump. Mm -hmm. Well, Hey, that, that's great. I mean, yeah, Carl Sagan, Cosmos. I mean, that's something I think that every person who was into science, at least of a certain age, you grew certain up. Certain age, yeah. Yeah. Maybe the younger people, I guess, well, there's the new Cosmos, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not Carl Sagan. It's not Carl Sagan, right? <laughs> But oh, well, it's great. Yeah, what about you? What, what are some inspirations as far as like hard science fiction? I mean, it's tough because my original sci-fi inspiration is the legend that is Frank Herbert's Dune. Ooh. But that's not more like hard fiction, not really hard science fiction. Mm. Um, I'd say Ender's Game, mm. just to pull out a really old school reference. Um, but certainly, honestly, a lot of more recent ones the martian um the expanse I, I oh, love yeah. oh mine it's adherence yeah, to yeah. physics and the, and the reality of, of that um, i wasn't sure if you're going to steal that one from me mentioning <laughs> um yeah i mean i don't know and just fall probably more so following through my job um i mean just i'm i'm so dialed into everything that's happening mass related so i just kind of it re-ups my enthusiasm for it every day Mm -hmm. And John, John is like the humblest person, but like just, just so we're all on the same page here, there are at least three, possibly five satellites in orbits right now that have his designs on them. Oh, wow. cool. That's Very awesome. Cool. Three. Three. <laughs> three, currently, but two to launch, right? No, three are up. They're all three are up there. Oh, all three are up already. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, talk, talking about the, the satellites and the physics and the actual, you know, ideas where you try to make something realistic while just going a couple steps beyond. I guess we'll start with you, John, because you were just bringing it up. What, what kind of, what does the space travel look like in this universe? Patching. <laughs> Talk about patching, John. There's wormholes, okay. there's hyperdrives. What does it look like? All right. So from the human perspective, we are, I'd say, halfway between now and where we were with the expanse. Pretty similar to Ad Astra around that level. 
of technology, um, but still our ships are slower. A, a lot of creating our narrative structure for Kuiper depended on figuring out how long it was going to take to get there and reasonably plotting out travel times around the solar system, seeing if um, waiting for correct planetary alignment, depending on years to try to Which optimize. John actually mapped. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why we picked 2091. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, from the alien standpoint, also a narrative structure um, gave us some guidance because some sci-fi, you know, aliens can jump instantaneously, point to point. Uh, Battlestar Galactica is an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, personally, for narrative structure, I don't like the idea that things can move so quickly. Um, Jupiter Ascending is another example. Just if you can go anywhere in the galaxy at any time, it kind of it breaks it a lot smaller. And also, too, the galaxy is huge. The galaxy, even in our story, is not fully explored, even though it's been occupied with spacefaring beings for tens of millions of years. We wanted to give that sense of scale. Um, so two main concepts. One, of uh, scale, as well as the idea of civilizations having built upon previous ones. So in the same concept of how the... For, um, sorry, the Covenant and humans discovered Forerunner technology in Halo. Um, there's an ancient race called the Builders that have built a warp gate system throughout the galaxy. Um, this I also wanted to, um, from a paper I read several years ago, there was a theory that if warp technology was possible, it would require the having built the path before the ship. And so mm -hmm. there were these warp gates, but they were specific vectors and there's technology built by an ancient race across millions of years to bridge these ones and then a later group of aliens that had no idea how these things operated but were able to use them piggybacked off that technology to build their own civilizations until at one point they abused that technology and eventually that system was destroyed which by left, a sentient robot overlord race yes <laughs> which left Millions, there's left trillions of alien beings now scattered throughout the entire galaxy, having full knowledge that aliens are real, you know, being probably stranded on the wrong planet and having no way of getting home. And so that created a vast dark age that lasted about a million years until someone discovered something called flow space, which is what our concept is for fast and light travel for our universe. Um, you sort of dip into a dimension that overlays ours. Um, if you went into it, you kind of see things in our galaxy, but everything is just sort of like light and, and fiery. And you can travel in that galaxy, sorry, in that other dimension, you're still traveling less than light speed relative to that, but relative to our dimension, you're moving much faster. So you kind of catch and jump into that one, move through it, and then jump back. And um, one of the caveats is it, um, different patching has different speeds. So that sets, you know, Ships that are older, slower, less mm. valuable, don't move as quickly. Ones that mm. are military, spy, special purposes can go you know, hundreds of light years per unit of time shorter. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's, that's generally how our system works for travel. Hey, there's a great question to jump off and talk about general sci-fi. We'll start with you, Matthew. What's your favorite like, space travel idea? Like if you, if you could... Create one instantly now. Would it be a wormhole? Would it be hyperdrive? Would it be this patching idea? Like, what would be your space travel? I mean, the most, to, to John's point, the most ideal is instantaneous. Well, that, that, that's just not really plausible. But from an ideal standpoint, you know, if I can get from where Earth to the edge of our galaxy, which is like 100 million light years instantaneously, then to John's point as to why we didn't do that in Kuiper is it makes a uh, an uncomprehensible distance of space, very travelable, which changes as everything. Well as, as well as the notion, if we're going to talk about why Fermi paradox and, and the Drake equation, why aliens haven't shown up, if they could instantaneously teleport anywhere, why wouldn't they have come to a naturally complex life sustaining planet? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So like if, 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 if mm -hmm. we did have that technology and they didn't show up, that would raise more questions. For yeah. sure. Maybe we What's might wrong be. with us? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I would say, like, you know, pat, patching is very, um, you know, nods a lot to uh, warp speed in 
in uh, Star Trek. It has its own properties and its own sort of methodology. But um, to me, that feels like the most plausible it is, is, a, is a, some sort of, you know, patch warp speed that allows you to move at relative speeds in one dimension while moving at faster than light speeds in another so that you're not really breaking the laws of physics, but you're kind of, you know, quantum mechanics bending them. Mm-hmm. And, and that feels plausibly possible with my, again, limited real understanding of these things. John can uh, either correct me or say that I'm uh, on the right track. But, uh, but yeah, I think something, so, something along those lines is, is probably the most, uh, the most realistic and, and would be the coolest. Now, Ben, when you're doing like mm-hmm. educational outreach and you're talking about just kind of space travel in general, do you have some bullet points of, of why you would, you would explain to somebody maybe how we can or can't travel that fast, like why we haven't made it to that point? Uh, no, cause most of my work is with kids. Um, but, uh, but still we do a ton of, we do a ton of propulsion programming. Like we do lots of rocket programs and stuff like that. And, and again, the question comes up, like how, why can't we go faster and things? So in the past when I've had to deal with this, um, you know, I, I talk a little bit about the sort of speed limit and that, um, you know, we just haven't, you know, there's this guy Einstein and he came up with this equation and this is kind of how it works and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and just kind of get to that point. But I always say, you know, a hundred years ago, we, we had no rockets that went to the moon either. So this is, I'm not saying that it's not possible at all, but this is, this is where we're at right now. And this is why we don't have it. Um, you know, the fastest that we can do are these really huge, you know, controlled explosions basically. Um, which is fascinating. And I think it's, it's great. Um, and I, yeah, I was going to say, I think, um, yeah, as long as you kind of set it up as like, you're in this flow of history and right now this is what we do and this is what we know, but someday we might be able to get some more. Most, most people are pretty fine with that. Great. Great. And then to, to get to the po- point that I guess I would jump in as a biologist, the stuff that really geeks me out when I'm watching movies is the alien life forms. I don't want you to give too much away. <laughs> One thing that always bugs me is somebody who's in biology. Um, you're watching, I love Star Trek, Star Wars. The aliens always kind of just look like people. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. There's some science behind the idea that there might be like, you know, cephalization where you have a head and these basic structures. But in reality, you know, uh, you have crows, you have octopus, you have people, you have all these intelligent species. I, so, so why don't you guys talk on that? And, you, and I, I, I'll start and I'll let John piggyback on it, but I'll just start with you will be very happy with Beyond Kuiper. Um, we have silicon-based life. We have carbon-based life. We've, uh, you know, we have sentient whales. We have, we have um, to your point, most, if not all, variations of sentient life forms that we could think of in all forms that they could take. Humanoid is one of many ways that a sentient, intelligent life form can uh, evolve in and it's really based on you know the 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 distance to their star and their atmosphere and the magnetism on their planet and 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 a uh, a myriad of other uh ecological um uh aspects to those planets and when we were creating the civilizations on all of these planets we you know we really went went there and i i'll just give you one quickly which i think is really cool we have a sentient robot species called the Kaleans. And the Kaleans homeworld is two times the size of Earth. Earth. And uh, originally the Kaleans, uh, th- their original creators were, were the Kaleans also. And they, because of the size of their planet, the uh, pressure of their atmosphere was so great that their AI and planetary based science was exponentially uh, farther along than any sort of space travel because it would take so much more inertia to get through into space. So as they created these sentient robots called uh, Kalean Ones, the Kalean Ones were looked at their creators more as parents and they lived harmoniously together. And the sentient robots said, let us help you get to space. And Mm -hmm. what happened was when they built that rocket that was able to go through, unfortunately, there was a biological toxin that was in the atmosphere line and it came down and 
basically killed all of the clans. But before they all died, the robots were like, let's transcend and merge our consciousnesses into a new species. Mm. And the Kaleans are this transcendence of the sentient AIs and the remnants of the biological Kaleans put into one basically eternal vessel made from the basically our vibranium, which is Kalean steel off of the moon on Kalea that they were able to mine after getting off the planet. Hmm. <laughs> that's, hey, that, that's, is that, that's great. Is that like one book? Did you that, 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 again? That, again, <laughs> I, like I said, our lore has lore. We just wrote that to have a good understanding of how the Kaleans operate within our society. That's cool. Yeah. So, so basically, every planet uh, that we've identified by name has a history at least that deep. Wow, that's great. That's great, John. Any anything you want to add on on the uh, ecological systems? Yeah, I mean, I guess to, to loop back to what Kurt said, I mean, the reason why a lot of those aliens look like humanoids is budgetary reasons. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, although I will, I will agree that um, from a book perspective, you know, you can get away with almost anything. For visual media, if you don't have certain humanoid aspects, there is an emotional disconnect. Um, but to that point, you know, we, we have a, you know, a couple of humanoid species that I think kind of help bring humans into a, a little bit, but there's, you know, sentient plants that are all leaves called an osonics, and they like spin around and fly through the air and people are kind of freaked out at them because they have no face or head and they can't talk. So they have to have like a, a mechanical techno implant put into them that can transmit their thoughts into something vocal because they're all telepathic and otherwise they would have no way of communicating with other aliens. And like there's, um, <laughs> You know, different evolutionary constraints that allow you know certain aliens to be more proliferous than others because they can survive on more planets. Uh, acknowledging like what are the optimal number of limbs that creatures can have for travel. Uh, I did a lot of studies on that, which keep coming back to two and four, mm -hmm. which is interesting um, because I'm sure there is some Earth limiting factors mm -hmm. for that. Um, but you know, sometimes people are like, "Well, what if this thing's got like a million? legs and once you scale up to a certain size oh yeah uh you know for, for understanding like you don't get faster being an arthropod at eight legs like at that point if you have four you can bound and move more quickly so it's interesting too because you you know on some level i think you go think like okay he, if the humanoids here and lovecraftian is here <laughs> you know we don't we want to exist somewhere in a healthy middle so i think also it identifies how diverse the galaxy could be. No, that's that's great. You know that that's that's speaking right to me. You know, I, I get the whole point of you got to put makeup on somebody in a movie, but you know, a movie like um, Arrival, where you have like these kind of squid alien things that, mm -hmm. to me, yes, more plausible. You know, they're still going to be like cephalization. They're probably still going to breathe some atmosphere. They're going to have hands or some kind of structure, but they're still not going to be people because even on Earth, you know, people are so rare. If you look at most of the two-legged things, they're kind of Dinosaur look. Yeah. I mean, pe people are weird, right? We could get into yeah. that. Like, we're the only species on this planet that looks different from one another. That's so strange. Well, right? I would disagree with that. I would say that we don't have the capability of understanding the nuances between other animals that they do, as well as they use smell and other things that we don't identify. See, science. There you go. Very nice. Well, you know, that's another great point. Uh, ben, when you're doing yeah. outreach with kids, um, do you delve into some of these things? Like, do you use, say, like science fiction as a stepping point to get kids interested in the hard science? Absolutely, all the time. And I think uh, our, the most direct way we do it is we actually show up at Comic-Cons and set up, you know, big hands-on science thing. You know, uh, we take over like 2,000 square feet of the floor space and bring a bunch of other science institutional partners in to do hands-on science, to get, uh, you know, JPL aerospace engineers or some of the researchers down there to talk to people. Uh, we'll program a couple of days worth of panels. Um, you know, it, we've used science fiction to sort of a jumping off point within, you know, small activities and things, but in a grander scale, it's being able to, to do the hard science outreach where there are science fans already almost 
everybody walking around a, a con is also a, a NASA geek or some sort of like science yeah. crazy nerd, right? Um, so we decided a while ago, we were like, why are we asking them to always come to us? We should just go to where they are. There's 30,000 of them in a weekend. We're never going to see that in a weekend. Let's just go there. And that's, that's what we do. That's so so cool. we leverage the, the sort of environment of sci-fi, especially that cons can provide, and, um, and try to have a presence there. But, you, you know. That, say, to yeah. that, do you find that you can scale up? The, the learning curve on those because of the comic on crowd. Yeah, you mean what do you mean? You mean the the amount of sophisticated knowledge that we can get out? Yeah, that we, yeah. we can teach at a higher level. Yeah, it depends. I mean, what we do on the floor is different than what we program in the panels, right? So the yeah. panels tend to be a little bit more. Um, I mean, we tell everybody that's a public audience, but tend to be a little bit more academic, a little bit more technical, whatever. What we're doing on the floor is much more like sort of quick hit inspiration kind of stuff, things like that. Um, but just actually personal, a uh, little personal thing. My very first job in a museum was writing science books uh, for them. And my very first one was um, taking an episode of a 90s TV show called The New Explorers, um, where they uh, interviewed Mae Jemison, the, the astronaut, because she was on that Star Trek Next Generation episode. Right. So they took that episode and they brought it to the museum I was working with and they said, hey, we need you to make a science book out of this. So that's what I did. So right from the beginning, I was like taking science fiction and turning it into a, some sort of science education thing. Something. That's so cool. Um, that's fantastic. It's a, it's a, it really is a great leverage point. So unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. So I do have one question I want to finish up on. That was fast. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we got, we, got, we got our time limits, you know. It's, it's a comic con <laughs> thing. But let me, let me do, uh, before I ask my last question to kind of send us off, let me start with you, Matt, uh, Matthew. Where, where do we find Heavy Metal and where do we find Beyond Kuiper? Yeah, so uh, Heavy Metal is uh, heavymetal.com or uh, at Instagram at Heavy Metal. Uh, and Beyond Kuiper is on uh, pre-order right now on Heavy Metal site, Barnes & Nobles, Amazon, Books A Million. Really anywhere that you can get a book, you can pre-order Beyond Kuiper. It uh, hits um audible and bookstores on november 11th and uh and yeah great john do you have anything else um any other place you can find your we can find you other than heavy metal and beyond kuiper um uh, at <laughs> <laughs> uh, no truthfully i mean matt you know we co-wrote the book together but he is the business savvy front of the house one so <laughs> he's all the locations he's listed he could be the master of all those <laughs> works for me and, and ben where do we find you where do you find the museum uh the museum is the columbia memorial space center we're located just south of downtown la in the city of okay. downey on the old uh north american rockwell site where all the apollo spacecraft were designed and built and all the space shuttles were designed and built oh sick and john we should talk because we're always <laughs> looking for <laughs> engineers to come up and talk to people we're all virtual now because museums are closed but uh, uh we're doing all kinds of programming um actually so i'm sorry i I don't think I interpreted your question correctly. I'm physically, um, I live in Denver, Colorado. I work at the Lockheed Martin Space main facility in Littleton, Colorado. I know and, that place uh, well, actually. That's cool. That's cool. And um, everything that the United States ever sent to Mars has been built right there. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah. We've, we've got Orion. Uh, Mars 2020 is now down in Florida in the launch pad. Yep. Uh, Lucy, Europa Clipper, lots of missions going on there. Yeah. That's amazing. And then let me, let me kind of send us off on one question um, that I was thinking about. So with, with all the stuff going on in the world, um, I think one issue, you know, as, as four, I'm assuming white guys talking to each other here about science, let's start with maybe Ben and go around. How do we get more diverse voices and how do we get more people interested in science and science fiction? Uh, we just have to to be intentional about representation in what we do. Uh, be intentional about representation in things like this, in in cons, in in science. Um, you know, just we have to make it a point to do it. <laughs> John, how about you? How do, how do you get more people interested in what we're doing out here? Um, I mean, it's it's a long process. One, it is you know, it starts with representation, and I think representation in literature 
you know, we're we're very conscious of when we were writing the crew for Kuiper to be diverse, you know, nationally, culturally, um, amongst the STEM positions and other uh, types of jobs um, and occupations. But I think it actually really is kind of when it translates to film, when things do that to a visual media, that the idea of multi-ethnicity really reaches a lot more people and reaches a lot more children and they really grasp that. So, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly as Ben said. And it's just, it's carrying the process through all the way. Great. And Matthew, same question to you. How do we get more people interested in stuff like heavy metal? Yeah, and um, I mean, to, to piggyback off of what both of uh, them said, it's to me, it is, it's the education system, right? It's all systemic. Ooh, so sorry. It's all, <laughs> it's all systemic from, from, you know, preschool to kindergarten to grade school and college. If we're not, you know, if we're not being diverse in our opportunity to share science and, and literature and, and education at all ages, and then allow whoever decides that that speaks to them to, to, to double down and learn more about it. I mean, it's, it, that, that's where the system breaks, right? Education to me is, um, is the, the only thing that matters and, and, and it needs to start early and it needs to be, you know, much more inclusive of ideas and, you know, to kind of bring it full circle to what uh, Ben kind of started the conversation with is it needs to be acceptable to be wrong and then find the right answer. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's okay. a key point. I, I've been wrong plenty of times in my life, but, <laughs> but hey, talking to you guys has been right today. Um, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to, you said Beyond Kuiper is going to be audible? It's going to be, so Podium will be putting it out for us on Audible. Uh, the physical book will be sold on our website as well as in Barnes and Nobles across the country, um, wherever Amazon. Books a Million sells. What? Amazon. Amazon, uh, Target, I believe Walmart's picking it up. So it, it should, be, uh, should be available in most places that you uh, spend your day-to-day -day, uh, shopping. Right. I'll be listening to in the car. I still drive to work, so I'll, I'll get the Audible. Thank you guys so much for talking to me. I uh, love Thank science. You. Keep up the Thank fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Go science. Go science. <laughs>